Good day. First, obviously welcome you to this uh, conference today. And before I start, I'd like to thank all the volunteers who've made this possible. I'd like to thank Matt Wilgris, Francisco, Lee and all the others who've done such a brilliant job over the past several months on behalf of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, starting right with, or re leading up to the successful election of Hugo Chavez, the death of Hugo Chavez, the run-up to the recent election, and the ongoing fight against interference in the Venezuelan uh, society by, obviously, the United States. And also for establishing, I would argue, VSC in a central position in the British Labour and Trade Union movement. We've come a long, long way. And I think the way the organisation responded to all of those events that I've just listed is a sign of the kind of mature, effective work that has been done, and that work must be maintained. This conference obviously comes at a very, very important time, and I don't think I'm dramatising things too much when I say it's at a time when the revolutionary process in Venezuela is effectively fighting for its life. We'd initially called this conference to look at the legacy of Hugo Chavez. And reading the other day, I came across a quote which really sums it up. <coughs> Said of another person, his place shall never be with the cold and timid souls who know nothing of victory nor defeat. And I think we should recognise what a tremendous role Hugo Chavez has played in the 21st century. And when the history books come to be written, I'll tell you this, he will dwarf those so-called political giants that stride the stage today. <laughs> if you look at his ideas, the social achievements he oversaw, the significance of Venezuela for the rest of the continent and indeed for the rest of the world. Now there's a huge amount to discuss there, but perhaps the most important legacy uh, of Hugo Chavez was that for the first time he created a Venezuela where the majority was in charge, where democracy was ex expanded to actively involve all Venezuelans, where the wealth of the uh, nation would be used in the interest of the majority of the nation and not in the interest of the United States and the small percentage of the Venezuelan society that serves the interests of the United States. Now, these two important elements of Hugo Chavez's legacy a country ruled for the majority and in charge of its own resources and future are now threatened grievously. There's underway, those who are following the news, a desperate concerted attempt to oust the elected government of Nicolas Maduro following his victory on the 14th of April. And it stems from the Venezuelan right wing within the country, but it's backed by, as we know, Washington. Now, this attempt to overthrow the elected government has seen huge violence carried out by opposition activists. And I think we have to make the distinction here between the six, seven million people who voted for the opposition and the real activists within the opposition. And it's the politics of the Bolivarian revolution to split their side as indeed they're going to try and split our side. We've seen in this period of violence the targeted murder of government supporters. We've seen petrol bombing of health facilities that have been developed by the government. We've seen the attacks on the homes of political leaders and the home of uh, election officials. And we've even seen former military generals caught on camera training students on how to carry out violence. And opposition journalists calling on supporters uh, to target particular social services. So we've seen this violence and intimidation and it should be condemned. But still we meet with absolute silence, for instance, from the United States on this. And what is the nature of this opposition? This is not, and it has to be said, a democratic opposition. Certainly the leadership isn't. It's more in common with elements that we saw in Chile destabilising the Allende government and the kind of other dictatorships we've seen in Latin America. It has more in common with those than what we would class as normal opposition uh, activity. And it's not just the fringe elements. There appears to be a strategy of the leadership of the opposition to actually bring about a destabilisation. In fact, if you look closely, the day after the election, Capriles called for his supporters to discharge their anger. And this they truly did. And sadly, the opposition, as I said earlier, is being emboldened by Washington. 
but it's apparent silence, but it's activity behind the scenes. Before the election had even taken place, leading US uh, Secretary of State, official in the Secretary of State Department, said that it wasn't possible to have free and fair elections in Venezuela. I don't know if they're based on their activities in or experience in Florida or various other states of America. And she said that despite all the evidence to the contrary, she said that despite what Carter has said time and time again, that the Venezuelan electoral system is the best in the world. Now, since the results were announced, Washington has continued its support for the opposition campaign to have the results overturned. And you may have seen the latest in this, where Capriles, after demanding a recount, is now refusing to even take part in the recount itself. And the US is the only major government not to recognize the election results. The statement by all the governments of Latin America, France, Spain and Britain highlights how this is political meddling by the US. Now we know the close relationship between the US administration and the Venezuelan opposition. Huge amounts of US government funding have flowed into the Venezuelan opposition over the years. In fact, the latest cable from WikiLeaks underlines the purpose of this. It shows that in the run-up to the 2006 Venezuelan presidential election, the US, US State Department funded 3,000 meetings with democratic civil society, and with its aim being to isolate Chavez and split the Chavez movement. Now, it's not Chavez seeking to isolate, but Maduro, and their aim is clear. Rejecting the legitimate outcome as a stepping stone to overturning the elected government. And we have to be clear, while this is a small victory, it was nevertheless a legitimate victory. And Maduro's 1.8% winning margin is by no means exceptional. And if we take the standard American elections, you look at the election of J.F. Kennedy, Nixon, Carter, they all had a lesser margin than Maduro enjoyed recently. So Washington and its allies in Venezuela need to accept the most basic rule of democracy. It's a simple lesson. Whoever gets the most votes is elected. That needs drilling into their heads. <laughs> and we should also be clear that, though it was a close result, the non-recognition of the election has nothing to do with the actual results. Before the election, the ground was prepared not to recognise the outcome of the election. The election campaign was dominated, those who followed it, by weeks of right-wing media and opposition parties' attacks on the independent National Electoral Council. Capriles criticised the CNE in the speech announcing his candidacy in March. Capriles' driver was caught on tape saying that Capriles wouldn't recognise the results if he lost. And a week before the election, Capriles announced that he would not sign a National Electoral Council document to guarantee to recognise the results even though a similar document was signed by all the parties during the October presidential election. So this is an orchestrated campaign based on spreading falsehoods. The opposition's main argument is that the National Electoral Council is biased. Well, this is the same National Electoral Council that Venezuela's right-wing coalition last year asked to oversee its own internal primary elections to choose its presidential candidate. The election Capriles won. Capriles' team described the CNE at the time as an excellent indication of the democratic institutions in this country. I wonder what's made him change his mind. And of course they've been prepared to recognise the same electoral council results when the opposition wins, okay, including last December when the CNE carried out the election that saw Capriles elected as governor in his home state with exactly the same percentage that Maduro won in the national elections. So we have to see it has nothing at all really to do with the CNE. Nor is there any chance that fraud took place. I'm going to bore you with all the details about the kind of um, uh, tra the transparency and effectiveness of the elections in, in Venezuela. And now the government has said it will audit the rest of the votes. The opposition, as I've said earlier, is moving the goalposts. It's now withdrawn from the audit process altogether. So this is simply the latest attempt by Venezuela's right-wing opposition to override the will of the people. And there's a history in this. 
have done it before. Not just with the coups in 2002 and the 2003 economic sabotage aimed at ousting Chavez. Other times it has refused to recognise the results when it's lost or it's pulled out on the eve of elections when it was clear that it was lose, when it would lose. The opposition has shown over the years a total disregard for the will of the people and it's shown it again. And it's campaigning all over the world not to have the results recognised. This week, elements of the opposition went to France and Germany to get their governments to overturn their position of acceptance. And I'm sure that maybe in the future weeks we'll uh, be blessed with a visit to Britain of uh, some of these people as well. So we must ensure that a climate of opinion, especially by newspapers and politicians, is not created that allows our government to shift its position and back the United States. So if you're inspired by anything that uh, Venezuela Solidarity has done over the past decade, this period is really, really crucial. We've all got to step up to the plate and make sure, make sure that we do the necessary work. Um, I'll just close it on a few, few points. In the debates and discussions that followed, we've got to be extremely sober about it. I think people went into this election in an air of triumphalism, which I think was slightly misguided. So a lot of people were quite depressed at the result. But let's be absolutely sober. So we should analyse deeply, seriously, and in a concerned way what has happened in Venezuela. We should set and frame a number of actions and ideas that help us to move forward. We must support our camaradas in Venezuela in the most effective ways possible. And we must respond positively to any request they make. But remember this, it's not our role, and it's not the role of the European left, with its kind of less than successful period it's moving through, to lecture anybody in Latin America. <laughs> close on these words, how appropriate tomorrow is International uh, Workers Memorial Day, when we remember all the workers in this particular country who died as a result of industrial accidents. And the slogan that is the slogan for tomorrow is a slogan that fits the time of Venezuela, the death of Chavez and the victory of Maduro, and it's this, remember the dead, but fight for the living. Thank you.